It's the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. The Church Historians Press just released a landmark book of documents all about the Relief Society, the women's organization of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It was organized in 1842 with high hopes for benevolent service and holiness, and it was suspended in 1844 as a result of conflict and controversy. In part one of this special two-part interview with three of the volume's editors, we'll talk about the origins of the Relief Society and the founding documents that helped ensure its lasting legacy. Jill Mulvey-Durr is a retired senior research historian for the Church History Department. Kate Holbrook is a specialist in women's history, and Matthew J. Groh is director of publications, each of them at the Church History Department. Together with Carol cornwall Madsen, they edited the new book, The First 50 Years of Relief Society, Key Documents in Latter-day Saint Women's History. I'm here at the Church History Library with Jill Mulvey-Durr, Kate Holbrook, and Matt Groh. They're the editors of a new volume from the Church Historian's Press. It's called The First 50 Years of Relief Society, Key Documents in Latter-day Saint Women's History. Thank you guys so much for talking about this book. It's a real pleasure to go through the book and to meet with you about it. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, Blair. Blair. I thought we'd start out by talking about the first document that you put in this collection, and it's a revelation that Joseph Smith received um, for Emma Smith, and I believe it's the only revelation that was given exclusively uh, to a woman, and the Relief Society wouldn't come around for a, uh, another 12 years or so. So why start out the collection with a revelation that preceded the establishment of the Relief Society? Jill, why don't you uh, take that one? The revelation for Emma Smith is critical because it speaks of her role in expounding the scriptures and exhorting the church. And so far as we can tell, that role was not fulfilled in the years between 1830 and 1842. Uh, she, she is a, an elect lady, and that title is fulfilled in her appointment as president of the Relief Society. So since that revelation is cited by Joseph Smith when he organizes the Relief Society, it seemed important to have that document there as a, as a forerunner. So at that establishment, you had Joseph Smith actually referring back to that revelation. Um, did that continue throughout the history of the Relief Society, where women kept looking back to that, uh, to that revelation? Yeah, Matt? One, th one thing we see throughout this collection is that women continually referred back to a pair of founding documents. The first is the revelation to Emma Smith that we know as Section 25. The second is the minutes from the Female Relief Society of Nauvoo, uh, that throughout the 19th century, women uh, cited these founding documents, they talked about them, they read them in Relief Society meetings and in conferences. So that's one of the reasons to start with the revelation to Emma Smith is because women do continually look back to that and to the minister from Nauvoo. So both of these founding documents then um, became important to the Relief Society throughout the course of its history, uh, I guess you could say. So um, let's talk about the experience of the earliest Mormon women back before there was a Relief Society again. So this would have been around the time Emma Smith uh, is given this revelation by Joseph Smith. There were other women in the church. What was church experience like that, that's sort of different from what Latter-day Saint women today uh, experience? Kate? Well, everything was new. Everything was in the process of being created. There were no set standards, or maybe a new standard would come about, and people it would take a while for people to learn and participate according to that pattern. Did women have a lot of opportunities to speak? Because today we have women speaking in sacrament meeting, leading classes, uh, with sister missionaries, um, and, and this sort of thing. What kind of opportunities, or, or what was the position of women early on in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? In the early church history, we find that women didn't often participate at sacrament meetings, but they did add their voices at fast meetings. So they would be able to testify sort of in those monthly meetings. Yes. Were they called to, to teach classes or? Oh, well, at this point, I don't know that there were classes. Uh, women, many women in retrospect, gave singular importance to their conversion experience and their baptism. Uh, and following baptism, many women became informal teachers of their friends and relations. That was, uh, that was a typical part of women's lives. But there weren't uh, formally organized classes for teaching, and there was not a, a women's organization. 
So th these things were were not part of that early experience in Kirtland, although women opened their homes for meetings, uh, for uh, missionaries or for church meetings. And as Kate has mentioned, they, they testified in fast meetings. They contributed their inheritances uh, or other money they had for the building of the, the temple, for the support of, of missionary work or sewed clothing for missionaries. Certainly we see a lot of contributions with the building of the Kirtland Temple in terms of making curtains and uh, contributing to the, the building of the temple. I guess it's kind of like Emma Smith, the fact that she was called as an elect lady early on but didn't have like an institutional way to play that role is sort of symbolic of women's place in the church at that time as well, where they had many things to do, but as far as a set institutional uh, apparatus, it wasn't in place yet. So it's it's hard to get into that mindset. We've experienced church our whole lives with a Relief Society. So, And I, and I think we should mention that not... Uh, not everything was full blown, as Kate said at the beginning. There was, there was a lot of uh, working to establish uh, offices. The the first presidency itself was not established till 1832, and though the role of apostles was described in earlier revelations, the the quorum of the twelve was not called until 1835. So it was an exciting time as things took shape. There's a lot of potential there. So we're, this is interesting to look at the way the church itself developed. It, the restoration wasn't just presented in a, in a package with everything ready to go. So, and, it, and I think this book does a good job of laying out how that plays out with the Relief Society, which is the same thing that sort of happened in the larger church as a whole, as you mentioned. Uh, one of the things that the book talks about that early Latter-day Saint women uh, were able to participate in that, that, that we don't see much anymore is healing by the laying on of hands. Let's talk about that for a minute, um, because that, that's ignited the imagination of a lot of members of the church when they hear this about our history. Healing by the laying on of hands took different forms. One form that I have enjoyed studying is a ritual that, an informal ritual that women developed preparatory to childbirth. So they would give women blessings and bless different parts of their bodies when they were came close to having their babies. So it was connected to birth, to, to a motherly role. And this is one of the contexts where women would actually lay their hands on someone. Now, some people look at that and wonder, because today, uh, priesthood holders, men, male priesthood holders are the ones who uh, lay hands on to give blessings. Um, so the question of priesthood then comes up. Yes, and I think that question was raised relatively early. Actually, the, the first instances we have in this book of women healing occur at the meetings of the Female Relief Society of Nauvoo. Uh, we see an account, I think, on April 19th, 1842, of a woman who bears testimony of the, the efficacy of the sisters laying on hands to heal her. And this causes a lot of questions uh, for members of the society. Some don't think it's appropriate, and some do. And so I think the question of men being ordained versus women healing by faith arises quite early. And it's, it's persistent uh, in different eras of, uh, that this book presents. We see the, the question of, is, is it all right to, to lay on hands to heal in the name of Jesus by faith? Um, is, is, uh, are women allowed to, to heal by the authority of the, the priesthood? And the, the answer to that question seems to be consistently no. So, uh, but we see this question arise, as you've mentioned, during the 1840s and again through the 70s, 80s, 90s. It's, it's very much present. One of the interesting things about a book of documents like this is that you can see these discussions play out over time. Right, so, 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 so like Jill said, the question arises in Nauvoo is going to arise uh, uh, again and again. What, by what authority do women lay on hands to give these blessings of health and comfort? Uh, and, and, and so you can see that discussion uh, play out in the book. And, and, and leaders like Eliza R. Snow are, are, are clear that women are laying on hands uh, to give blessings by virtue of faith and not by virtue of ordination. I think there's also, in the early Relief Society minutes, there's some um, 
some sermons that Joseph Smith delivered to the Relief Society where he also addresses this. And do you uh, recall what J- Joseph's original instructions were? Joseph's uh, original instructions were that if, if, if women had faith to, to lay on hands and, and, and heal, then they were authorized to do so uh, in, in that time and place. Healing by faith was one of a number of gifts of the Spirit that members of the church experienced and participated in. The development of charity was another really important gift of the Spirit. Speaking in tongues was a gift of the Spirit. Uh, This is one we like to focus on right now because we now associate it with priesthood, but it, it was certainly to them, it was not the most salient gift that they exercised or sought. And it, so it was one among many, right? Yes. And, it, it, and they did talk about differences between uh, laying on hands according to faith, as the New Testament right. talks about, versus uh, a priesthood blessing. Yeah. And later on, that distinction became more firm, and I think this book shows over time that distinction becoming more firm. Does this book touch on the cessation of that practice among Mormon women, the laying on of hands through faith? That, that happened more in the early 20th century. So we, we don't have documents in this book since we end in 1892. We, we don't have specific documents, but we have tried uh, in the footnote annotations to uh, discuss the relevant sources and uh, bring things up into the 20th century with respect to this question because it has been such a burning question. So readers would find some references there that would carry them into the 20th century, even though we haven't elaborated uh, the documents beyond 1892. That's Jill Mulvader. We're speaking with her and Kate Holbrook and Matt Groh here at the Church History Library. Um, So I wanted to talk now about the formal establishment of the Relief Society. So let's paint a picture of the broader context. There were women's societies more generally, and the Relief Society can be looked at as one among a crowd of of these types of organizations, but it also stood out. So let's talk about the context a little bit. Kate, do you want to? Kate Holbrook, do you want to um, talk about that? Well, women were women throughout the country were happily engaged in benevolent activities, and and probably the initial idea of Margaret Cook and Sarah Kimball to put together a sewing society. What they envisioned was probably very similar to what women were doing throughout the country then. It's like they looked around and saw a need. And then they, but then they organized. Well, well, these groups did have, they had constitutions and they had presidents or presidentesses and, and that's what they envisioned. Eliza Arsenault wrote out a constitution for the organization and they took it to Joseph Smith and, and he didn't say, oh, this is terrible. He said, this is good. But he wanted to create something more. And that more is really significant. That more is the power of God is in the organization. And that's what he said, I turned the key to you. And he turned the key to them so the power of God would be in their organization. Jill, do you kind of get the sense that this was kind of a co-production then, not just between women in the church and and the prophets, so women and the men, but also with God in the mix. They obviously saw God in the mix. So it's like this is a grassroots thing that got the attention of the prophet who then kind of elevated it. So it's, it's like... It's like they all kind of created this society together. Does that make sense? I think that makes perfect sense. Uh, I, I think Joseph Smith was blessed with the gift to, to translate and transform many of the, the f- forms uh, about him. This, this was a great gift. And uh, as Kate has mentioned, he could immediately see possibilities beyond what the women themselves had imagined. Uh, and so the Relief Society became a conduit not only for women's work in ministering to the poor, but it became a, a, an important preparatory uh, forum to, to help women prepare to receive the ordinances of the temple and to be engaged in, in priesthood blessings, in, in, the, in the blessings and privileges of the priesthood that's what uh, Joseph said. So he wasn't ordaining them to priesthood offices per se, but he saw this as, a, as an opportunity to bring women into the ecclesiastical structure of the church and at the same time prepare them to receive the ordinances of the temple where they, especially through marriage, could become part of a, an order of the priesthood. So 
he envisioned uh, an organization that had tremendous significance, and it was life-changing for them. I kind of see, I like how you put it in the context of Joseph sort of looking around at the materials at hand and, and, and sacralizing them in a way. And it's, it's interesting to think about, you mentioned the connection to the temple and how the Relief Society became sort of a conduit and a preparation for the temple rites that would be given to the church pretty shortly, a couple of years after. But also they're sewing clothes and they're feeding the poor. And, 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 and so the sacralization seems to work both ways, it, tying up to the temple, but also sacralizing these sort of everyday activities, especially in, in the woman's domestic sphere. Well, I think one of the distinctive things about uh, the 19th century religious beliefs of Latter-day Saints was that they would have rejected this dichotomy of the sacred and the secular, right? I mean, to, to, to them, uh, a Relief Society uh, store was a sacred endeavor, right? And, 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 and we don't quite think in, the, in, in those same ways, but, but I think they very much would have, have said there is, there is no dividing line between the sacred and, and, and the secular. So the Relief Society provided this forum then for women to get involved in um, benevolent activities, for them to be instructed, um, not just by uh, the Prophet Joseph Smith, but also by other women. Uh, what sort of topics would come up? Uh, do we see in the minutes, because there's a minute book that they kept, and a lot of its names as they kept new membership records and these types of things. What else do we see in these early minutes that we can find in this book that you've just put together? Well, you see a number of things. One is that you see uh, a record of the teachings. Uh, so, for instance, Joseph Smith visits the society on nine occasions. On six of those occasions, he, he teaches. And so we have uh, this record of Joseph Smith's teachings uh, to the Relief Society. And, and they really saw this as a prophetic, a sacred record. They would go back to these sermons again and again and again in the 1800s. Another thing that you see is just the very practical workings of how you care for the poor, right? And so oftentimes uh, there, there are cases presented. There's a widow and she can, uh, she can sew. Who will hire her? There's a newly uh, arrived immigrant, uh, a single mother with a child. Who will take her in, right? And, 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 and you see the, just this very pragmatic working out of the, of the problem of poverty, of the problem of suffering in the Relief Society. But I love those moments because you'll see a problem asserted and then you'll see people immediately jumping in with their ideas, whatever they have to offer. And often it wasn't much. I have a little bit of fabric. I can sew the fabric that she's donating. My husband has some cornmeal we can give to these hungry people you've described. And just this spontaneous response to the suffering they hear about. And I must say, I think that one of the great strengths of this book is that um, it presents documents, and so there is, uh, we have women's own words. There's, there is a, an immediacy, an intimacy to the way these documents speak, and uh, I think this is particularly true when it comes to the, the needy and their situations and the way women reach out. These are, these are very powerful records in that sense. How many women are we talking about? Uh, how did the society grow? Um, it's in Nauvoo, so what, what were the approximate numbers looking like here in those from 1842 to roughly 1844? Well, it, gr it grows quite quickly. Uh, so there's, there's a concern about how quickly it's growing, but it, but it grows to uh, about 1,200 women in, in relatively short order. And it's a different process than we have today. You applied to be a member of the Relief Society. Uh, people had to vouch for your good moral character. And I think this is related to uh, something that was mentioned earlier, which is that the Relief Society uh, can be seen as, as a temple preparation course. Uh, and, 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 you know, th there was a, this idea that they were creating a select society of, of, of the virtuous women in Nauvoo uh, who could then go forward, participate in these temple rites. Let's expand on that idea of virtue for a minute, because a lot of times today when we hear the word virtue, it's sometimes tied to the idea of sexual morality chiefly, and, and that was important. We'll talk about that as polygamy comes up. But it seems to me that virtue was also a bigger concept at the time. What, what were people thinking about at the time when they talked about being virtuous women uh, of the Relief Society? What were they looking for in, in new members of the society? There, there was a, an, another mandate given to the Relief Society besides uh, caring for the poor, 
and that specifically had to do with watching out for the morals of the community. And I think this is related to your question about virtue. The women felt a concern to, to make sure that uh, people weren't cheated, for example, if they, they saw a problem if, if uh, a man were cheating a widow out of uh, income that she needed. So this, this question comes up. More frequently, I think the, the question of moral purity, of, of chastity, is an issue. And uh, this becomes a very complicated question in Nauvoo because of the uh, introduction of plural marriage and particularly the fact that it's introduced confidentially. So we have, we have some rumors circulating about relationships that may or may not be authorized by Joseph Smith. And I, I think this is a, a difficult thread sometimes to tease out in these minutes. And uh, in our annotations, we've, we've tried to do that as, as uh, carefully and, th and thoroughly as, as possible. If we know, uh, if we know the persons uh, who, who were um, being defamed, in a sense, or we, we've tried to sort some of that out in a way that has, has meaning to people. One woman that she's referred to as the widow Nyman applied to be a member of Relief Society and two of her daughters were accused of being seduced by a man in the community and so she was denied membership but then later she becomes a Relief Society president in Utah. That's a story I like because it, it shows that uh, she stuck with it. You know, there was a, probably a little bit of public humiliation there and, and she came back and stuck with it. The whole culture was so different back then. I mean, for example, confession was a lot more public. Uh, mm -hmm. Today, uh, members of the church confess privately, either to offended parties or to an ecclesiastical leader, but confession back then was something that you would often do before the community. So this kind of public scrutiny uh, might be surprising to see uh, when it comes up in the record here, but it was that was sort of the way that they did things, uh, even though we don't now. So plural marriage starts to become a topic, and how do how do you see it start to enter into the minutes? It it doesn't seem like do they confront it right on because of rumors or in the introductory matter? You frankly talk about how Joseph int started introducing plural marriage and and that it was secretive and 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 you know you're you're laying it out on the table. How does it play out in the minutes though? They don't lay things out on the table. And if you didn't know that plural marriage was going on, it's possible, I think, to read the minutes and not, not see what's going on. But the better you know the characters involved, the more you can say there really is some pain there of, because of the secrecy of people trying to figure out what's going on and, and what's right and what's authorized and what isn't. The, the gossip uh, that buzzed about in Nauvoo seems to have been aimed at all kinds of, of people. And I think that some of the hurt comes through in the minutes, again, uh, without, without some annotation to, to clarify that. It's not always evident. But I think there is, there is hurt there. And you see Joseph Smith addressing it in terms of charity and these admonitions toward uh, for the women that are directed around the subject of, of charity. He does not want them to be contracted in their feelings. He does not want them to be self-righteous. He wants them to reach out to those who've made mistakes and embrace them and love them. And uh, personally, those are some of my favorite parts of the, the minutes. And they're really spawned by some of these rumors and and some of the the rejection of members. Um, I think that's a, a poignant part of this minute book. So it kind of sheds a little bit of light, not only on uh, the, the practice of polygamy from the men's standpoint, but these records also, you start to get a better idea of how women were reacting at the time. And as Kate said, it's not a it very, it's mostly not obvious. It's very subtle. People are speaking euphemistically or sort of skirting around the issues that are still there. Emma, as the president of the society, 
uh, becomes increasingly concerned. And you talk about how she went from not supporting Joseph Smith in, in polygamy when she was made aware of it to to acquiescing to plural marriage uh, as she understood it and then switching back again and, and saying no. And then she, uh, there's a document that comes up that gets presented to the Relief Society. And let's talk about that document, A Voice of Innocence. Well, A Voice of Innocence uh, is written to rebut allegations of widespread immorality in Nauvoo. Uh, and, and so th- it's, it's a document that's going to be presented in four Relief Society meetings in March 1844 and accepted by the Relief Society as a way of saying that these allegations that there's widespread immorality in our community are false. Right, and, and, and the allegations do relate to rumors about plural marriage. It's almost like you had two different systems going on, right? Right. Or, or multiple, right? You had Joseph right. Smith, who, who said that he had this revelation to do it, and, 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 but he sort of oversaw that. But then you right. also had other figures who saw that and said, oh, hey, I can do that. Right. Yeah, you, you do have people who, from the perspective of, of Joseph Smith, took some of his teachings that they get wind of privately and, and, and use it as a pretext uh, for seducing women and, 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 and this sort of thing. So, so um, they are grappling with that issue. And then they're just grappling with, uh, the, like Jill said, the confidentiality of plural marriage. That, that this isn't something they're talking about privately, that, that there really is uh, a real gap in the, in the community in, in, who, in the understanding of plural marriage. Where did it come from? Is it authorized by Joseph Smith? Is Joseph Smith practicing plural marriage? Many Latter-day Saints either don't know or are confused about this, uh, and then some of them do know, right? So, so you see these gaps uh, in understanding, and you see that in the Relief Society as well, where some of the women are participating in plural marriage. Uh, some know about plural marriage and support it. Some know about plural marriage and oppose it. Uh, and so you see that... Um, those that strife playing out uh, sort of underneath the surface of the minutes. One of the things I picked up in in the intro matter and in the notes was this nuance that you're describing, that there were people yeah. who knew about it, right. and some of them uh, felt that they uh, that it was of God, and some of them didn't. And then, you know, but you're careful about how you describe those people. There were people who didn't approve of plural marriage, but they also weren't demonized in this book. They weren't presented as doubters or as uh, necessarily as opponents to Joseph Smith, although some, some of them actively became uh, opposed actively to Joseph Smith. But I think Emma, in particular, is presented pretty sympathetically in her opposition to the practice. So did you have contemporary Mormons in mind at all when, as you wrote this with, with Mormons today, some of whom aren't comfortable with polygamy? They believe Joseph Smith's a prophet, but don't believe uh, in polygamy. Did you have that in mind at all? Because it seems like you were careful in the way that you laid this out. Well, it's a complex story, and I think when you approach complex historical topics, you have to be nuanced. I'll say from, from my perspective, we're mostly focused on getting the history right, uh, but you know, certainly our own culture, our own day, shapes how we, we approach any historical topic. Yeah, but mostly because you know, the idea would be, well, if you, don't, if you think Joseph Smith is wrong about this, he must be a false prophet, but there, there are people who don't, uh, who don't see it that way, and I, I felt like... Um, there's room for, the, for that here, although um, it, Joseph's presented as revealing polygamy, uh, but the people who don't believe that aren't presented as necessarily, uh, you know, terrible people, I guess. Does that make sense? I think uh, one other comment related to this would be that um, just the question of, of the dimensions of Emma Smith's assignment and her authority and it seems to us so clear today that uh, she shouldn't have uh, worked in opposition to what her husband was teaching. Uh, maybe clear to us because we have such a, a clear sense of, of hierarchy and a first presidency and a quorum of 12 and a stake president and a, um, the, we see a certain relationship between the bishop and the Relief Society president. But that was all being worked out and Joseph Smith had opened the doors for women and uh, talked in very uh, strong terms about the importance of their presidency and the right of that presidency to preside uh, and given this mandate of of moral um, 
re- reform and moral watch care, uh, Emma Smith took her her opposition that she felt personally, and I think seems to have felt that this is what the documents would suggest that she could really persuade women to reject this principle and that that was somehow within her jurisdiction. And my my sense is that when Brigham Young says Joseph never started it, he he may he may have been saying that Joseph Smith never intended or wanted a female organization that worked in opposition to uh, the the structure of the church with the first presidency and quorum of the twelve. That may not have been what he was saying, but uh, I think I think Emma saw her position as a position of authority for the women of the church, and and we have tried to show that position, even though it's not necessarily the way things worked out over time or continued to be viewed. Yeah, there's a there's a clear concern to not just map this history onto the contemporary church uh, as it's constituted today. It, it's it's clear in, in its conscious. I think it's well done. You mentioned um, Brigham Young, and uh, people that haven't read the book won't be familiar with the what's included here is there's some statements that Brigham Young makes in 1845. So, so just to kind of give listeners the background, in 1844, the we have the last couple of recorded Relief Society meetings, and they this is about the time when polygamy is becoming an issue. This is leading up to the martyrdom of Joseph Smith, and, and the introduction talks about uh, all of the factors that, that played into that. And the Relief Society, with all the tumult going on and all the problems, uh, stops meeting. And typically, they would st- stop meeting for the winter anyway. So there's this period of waiting until the spring. So spring passes, it's 1845, women are starting to maybe look at starting up the Relief Society again, then Brigham Young has a meeting with high priests and with 70s and says, I'm suspending the Relief Society. And one of the things he says is a puzzling statement about um, Joseph not starting it, and it's not entirely clear what he means because it's very clear that Joseph Smith was heavily involved in in the Relief Society. And so you're saying it's possible that, that Brigham was saying he didn't want to set up two alternate opposing leadership stru- structures within the church. That's one possible reading of... That, that's a possibility, yes. Uh, any, uh, did, can you think of any other ones? Because I'm puzzled. Like, I read that statement from Brigham Young where he said, Joseph didn't start it. I said, I, don't, I have no idea what he means by oh, that. Oh, I, I think one possible interpretation is that Brigham said hard things in anger, and uh, I'm not sure that he was totally concerned with uh, fact-checking at that moment in time, right? I mean, this is this is an intentionally uh, an intensely emotional period for Brigham. Uh, this is eight months after after Joseph is martyred. Uh, Brigham has this fear that uh, he will be martyred as well. Uh, Brigham Young says later in his life that he only had uh, one unruly member, a part of his body, and that was his tongue. Right. That yeah. You know, his record he, makes it clear. He's, he's quite frank that uh, you know he 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 could make some mistakes in 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 what he said and 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 clearly Emma is grieving and and Brigham is grieving and and he says some really hard things about Emma about the Relief Society uh, in anger, uh, but then you see his later actions and he becomes a champion of Relief Society. Right. So so I I, I just wouldn't put uh, too much weight on any particular thing he says and. In, in that March 1845 meeting. I think the book does a, a good job of that. It, it, it does add all this extra context of, you know, there there were probably some personal things going on that, that led Brigham to, um, in his suspension of the, of the Relief Society. There were economic considerations with Joseph Smith's estate and disagreements with Emma over that and Emma's concern for her family and, and obvious reasons why she would, uh, um, you know, be as forthright and as, as uh, demanding as she was, uh, and justifiably so. So I think um, as you guys lay it out in this book, uh, it, it, it's pretty clear. Um, you, you, I, I really appreciate the way that you lay out the evidence and without trying to um, force anyone's hand in how they interpret it, but just sort of put it on the record. Here's what we know about what the documents tell us about what happened. And you really try not to go further than that. Yeah, one additional context about the, that cessation of Relief Society that that uh, I've, I've recently come to understand is that, that there is a, a kind of a pulling in of the church structure in, in 1845 as, as, as they're beginning to think about having to move west and things like that. So a month after he makes these statements to the Relief Society, in General Conference in April 1845, he suspends missionary work, 
right? So, so, so it is this, this time of kind of uh, pulling in uh, so that they can focus on, on the safety of the church and getting blessed. And there's also actually expanded opportunities for women at this time as well because the temple is being completed. And so the book talks about the roles that, uh, that women begin to play in the temple. How did you um, go about treating that? Because it's a delicate issue. The temple is a sacred thing for Latter-day Saints, and so we're careful about how we talk about the temple. But uh, you're also fairly forthright in the kind of rites that were going on, washing and anointing, and the types of ordinances that women were involved uh, with administering. So as the Relief Society sort of was suspended, here comes this arena where it's kind of de facto still operating almost. Women still have all this, these new things that are coming to them and new things they're being involved with. How did you treat, go about treating those temple questions? Well, we don't have any documents uh, in the collection outlining the temple activities, but we do want to give a, 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 a complete picture of, of, of what women were involved in. So much of, of the teachings in the Navajo Minutes do relate to those uh, temple ceremonies, and it was so important for women at the time, uh, the Nauvoo Temple experience. Uh, one of the things that I think that uh, we tried to do in the introduction is to lay out the centrality of the temple uh, in, in, in women's lives and to say, you're not going to see the temple in these documents because that's generally not how Latter-day Saints approach the temple. Yep. I mean, they, they, they don't write in detail about the temple experience. But if you don't understand how central that was, you're going to misunderstand a lot of Latter-day Saint spirituality in the 1800s. And so, so we've tried to lay that out concisely, candidly. Do you think the temple did sort of play that role? I mean, it seemed like from the introduction, that's you didn't say it in so many words, but it seemed like it was pretty clear that even as the Relief Society suspended, that there was still this sphere in which women were operating, and then just all the day-to-day -day stuff that they were dealing with and preparing to move. I think the 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 power that women felt from the temple uh, resounds through the the full fifty years that this book covers. Uh, in Kirtland, when the the preparatory ordinances were were given, women were not part of those ordinances, and for some of them, that was painful to be excluded from that uh, divine, that access to divine power. So I think in Nauvoo, you, you see uh, the dimensions in which Joseph has um, a great desire to bring women in through the, the encouragement of the spiritual gifts, through the, the new ecclesiastical assignment, and then this, this final and, and overarching inclusion in the, the temple and several women it's it's interesting we don't have women really noting in their diaries at least not diaries that we found a lot of concern about the end of relief society meetings but we can track a lot of excitement about the the temple and the feeling of unity surrounding the temple that's that is evident in in documents and it it continues through women's uh, experiences in the in the Relief Society. They they continue to, uh, of course, make contributions to meeting houses, make contributions to the the temple in Salt Lake and the temple in St. George. That's that's certainly not absent. But this uh, sense of access to to divine power that somehow the endowment and their marriages distinguish them, they make them different from the women of the world. It's, it's very much present, it's treasured by them, and they, they want to be true and faithful to those covenants. That's Jill Mulvader. I'm talking with her, Kate Holbrook, and Matt Grother, the editors of the first 50 years of Relief Society. It's a book of key documents in Latter-day Saint women's history. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast. In the next episode, we'll pick up where this one left off. After Brigham Young suspended the Relief Society about 10 years and 1,300 miles later, how did the Relief Society make such a comeback during the 1850s? We'll also talk more with the editors about the process of making their new book, The First 50 Years of Relief Society, and also about the place of women's history within the overall history of the LDS Church.